about when to stand up and pray or preach or any of the other things us pastors do when we lead God's people in worship. And, and God revealed quite a bit to me over the course of the day. I, I thought it was ironic, however, given this series on fasting, that he spent a lot of time talking about food. <laughs> Leonard talked about all the times in the Gospels when Jesus ate with sinners. The truth is, Jesus spent a lot of time eating good food with bad people. He also reminded us that the best wine ever made was Jesus' wine, and said to the teetotaling Baptists in the room, they just needed to get over that fact. <laughs> Leonard even went so far as to summarize the Old and New Testaments, and I thought this was so great, in three sentences each, in ways having to do with food. First, he summarized the Old Testament this way. They are trying to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. And then the New Testament, this way. I love you. I forgive you. Let's eat. And you know what? I think he's right. And that these summaries are just absolutely brilliant. So it is no wonder, then, that I agreed with him when he said that the two most important ministries in the church are, guess what they are? Children and food. Children and food. Still, the, the scriptures have a lot to say about fasting, our passage for tonight included. Here in Isaiah, we read in verse 2 that the Israelites are indeed seeking the Lord day after day. And that they are involved in fasting. That they feel that God has let them down. Their fasting is not acknowledged. Their prayers are not heard. They say in the first half of verse 3, why do we fast and you don't see? Why afflict ourselves and you don't notice? The prophet answers the people of Israel by identifying a disjunction between their religious practices and their actual manifest judgment, justice. There is a disconnect. Second half of verse 3 through verse 5. Yet on your fast day, you do whatever you want and oppress all your workers. You quarrel and brawl, and then you fast. You hit each other violently with your fists. I went ahead for your words. You shouldn't fast as you are doing today if you want to make your voice heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I choose, a day of self-affliction, of bending one's head like a reed, of, of lying down in morning clothes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? God's people were simply going through the motions of a fast in an attempt to hear from God, all the while complaining because they weren't seeing results. They were completely missing the point. Yes, fasting and prayer are always appropriate. Always appropriate, but only when they are appropriately motivated. Their sin is that they were using fasting as a try, as a means to try and manipulate God. You see, fasting and prayer do not change God. Fasting and prayer change us. In her Bible study, Ashley quite humorously wonders what the Israelites' fasting would have looked like if they posted about it on Facebook. One post might have read something like, spent the whole day fasting and still haven't heard from God. <laughs> or this, I thought this is okay. Those extra sackcloth and ashes sure are going to come in handy in the fast I'm getting ready to start. I'll see you on the other side. Hashtag fasting. Hashtag off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> now enter Isaiah, who chides the Israelites on the lack of integrity in their fast. He calls them out 
on the hypocrisy in their actions. Author Brennan, Brennan Manning wrote, The greatest single cause of atheism in the world is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. The fasting that Isaiah is denouncing here is worthy of that same criticism. Their religious behavior didn't match up with their actions. This is not at all, at all, the sort of fast that God wants. So then what sort of fast does God want? The prophet states this pretty clearly in verses 6 through 8. In fact, in those three verses, we see at least nine benefits to fasting in the manner God chooses. Beginning with verse 6, releasing wicked restraints. Fasting has the potential to provide freedom from our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, the things in our lives that hold us back, that keep us from becoming the people God longs for us to be. The second one, untying the ropes of a yoke. Untying the the ropes of a yoke. Fasting can help us solve problems, untie things, un solve problems that we might be facing. The third thing, still in verse 6, setting free the mistreated. Fasting can bring revival to a person's life. Fasting can restore them, return them to vitality. Remember last week I said fasting is soul work? Fasting can win a broken person's soul. The fourth, still in verse 6, breaking every yoke. Fasting has the potential to conquer our mental and emotional problems. Moving on to verse 7, we find the fifth. The prophet asks, isn't sharing your bread with the hungry? And bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them, and not hiding from your own family? I mean, that's very simple. Fasting can help us meet the physical needs of others. Now in verse 8, number 6. The prophet followed his question with this, Then your light will break out like the dawn. I shared this from my own experience last week. Fasting can bring us clarity. Our light will break out like the dawn. Clarity comes like the dawn. This is why people will fast for discernment. People will fast when they have important decisions to make. The seventh, and you will be healed quickly. Fasting can bring healing. A friend of mine in the north was having some real digestive challenges thinking that you might have developed um, a gluten sensitivity or um, become allergic to, to some things. And so he went on an elimination diet like Lenora and I have been doing. And he found that the conclusion of the elimination diet, he didn't have to eliminate anything at all. That over the time of the period, there were two months that he was doing this, he'd given his body enough of a break, enough, of, enough time to recover and to heal that he didn't have to stop eating um, anything that had a trouble in. The fasting he did from the foods that had been trouble in helped heal his body. Number eight, your own righteousness will walk before you. Now, as a spiritual discipline that helps focus our hearts on the things of God, fasting helps us lead a more righteous life. It can help us become more fully the people God made us to be. And then finally, the ninth. And the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. We certainly fast for the glory of God. For the glory of God. And our faithfulness can be rewarded by God's faithfulness to us in return. God's protection. Now, you know, these nine benefits to fasting in the manner God chooses make a pretty hefty what I did there. Hefty promise that God gives through the prophet Isaiah. And yet what is revealed through fasting really does lead to all of those things. 
Fasting restores our relationship with God. It brings righteousness to our lives. And it sets us free from the things that bind us. And fasting also reveals a significant truth about our humanity. We are hungry. And hungry people become desperate. But oftentimes the hunger that we feel isn't physical. Rather, it's, it's spiritual. We seek to be accepted by God, by others, even to learn how to accept ourselves. We seek to be loved and to find meaning in our lives. Think about all the places to which we too often turn, hoping to find things like acceptance, love, and meaningfulness. Things like financial gain, popularity, success, a whole list of things, even at the expense of others. But there is something about fasting that helps us reorient ourselves from those kinds of things. Reorient our priorities. So when we're fasting, the, the feeling of, that we get, the physical hunger, reminds us of who we are in our most basic human form and gives us an awareness of how we might learn to depend on God's provision more than our own self-reliance. Listen again to this promise the prophet gives about fasting in verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually and provide for you, even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. This is a, a significant vision that the prophet is casting. And, and it makes me think of the passage that you know, we might hear on Ash Wednesday. It's typically a lectionary passage for Ash Wednesday. But when, when Jesus entered into his ministry, what was the first thing that he, before he went into his ministry, what did he do? He fasted for 40 days in the desert. I mean, talk about harsh places. The only way that Jesus was able to do that was through God's continual guidance. So by practicing scarcity, scarcity we can actually experience Abundance. I mean, that was one of the things that just blew my mind being in Malawi. I mean, they weren't practicing scarcity. They were, they were living scarcity. Not by, by choice as part of their spiritual discipline, but just by their condition. But the, their abundance, their joy in the Lord is unlike anything I've ever seen. By knowing the depths of despair and need, we, we find rescue. By planting seeds of sacrifice, we reap a harvest of joy. Verse 12 even gives us a new name in the process. I, I love this. They will rebuild ancient ruins on your account. The foundations of generations past you will restore. You will be called mender of broken walls. Restorer of livable streets. We live in a world with a lot of broken walls that need mending. Amen. There are a lot of streets that need restoration. Amen. The, the common English Bible titles this chapter from Isaiah, Fasting from Injustice for Good Reason. Through our prayer and fasting, may we see God's provision, even in the parched places. May our lives be springs of water that won't run dry. And may we, who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, committed to making a difference in the world, become members of broken walls and restorers of liberal streets. So let us pray. Blessed God, your witness to us in Scripture is filled with allusions to fasting, and I know that the spiritual discipline is closely connected to prayer. I know that fasting is much more than simply abstaining from food for one day, or parts of days, or on special days. Fasting is an attitude, a discipline of the Spirit. 
It has to do with my longing to be closer to you, my dearest friend. When I am overwhelmed by sorrow because of the hurtfulness of my words and actions, fasting can be the food for my healing. When I have fallen into a pattern of overeating and have harmed my own health because of it, fasting can remind me that food is a gift in my body or temple. When foolish and hurtful desires well up within me, fasting can refocus my energies and my life on what is truly noble. When I have abused your good gifts of any kind, fasting can restore a proper perspective toward your many blessings in my life. When I am struggling in my life with prayer, fasting can draw me closer to you in my efforts to share my deepest longings and my heartfelt desires. When I need to hear your voice, your corrective, as well as your comforting words, fasting can open my ears to your still, small voice within. When in the midst of my blindness you offer me a precious treasure to lift my soul, fasting can open my eyes to perceive your blessed presence in all things. Certainly it is important for me to fast, as it were, from sin, from pride, vanity, foolishness, and anger. But you also call me to discipline my spirit by self-denial, so that these unholy attitudes and actions cannot take root in my soul. Teach me then, O oh Lord, how to fast in a proper way, in a way that you choose, that will enable your loving spirit to shape and guide my life. Keep my heart and mind focused on you at all times. Remind me that fasting is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Enable me to be attentive to the inward and spiritual gift. Guard me from extremes that drive love out of my efforts to draw closer to you. Empower me to pray much and to translate my self-discipline into acts of kindness and mercy to others. When I fast, O oh Lord, come to me in all the fullness of your love. Change my heart. Clean up my life. Conform me completely to your will and to your way. Make me zealous to glorify you and offer myself up to you anew for your service. Above all else, Make me more loving.